I'm Peter Tierfeld. I have a new backdrop today. Um, I'm the Advancement Consultant at St. Mary's Music School and welcome to Cultural Conversations. Uh, today we will give you some insight into conservation planning and landscape design. And before I hand over to our host uh, and our guest speakers, please ensure that you are muted. Um, there will be time for questions at the end. And if you'd like to, um, uh, throughout the presentation, uh, put your questions into chat, I will grab those questions so that afterwards I can bring those questions to the attention of Keith Bruce. <clears throat> and I say over to you, Keith. Hello, and uh, welcome to you all. Um, thank you very much, Peter. Um, uh, I'm uh, Keith Bruce. I'm the co-founder of um, VoxCarnegs.com, which is a, a new um, class, newish now, um, classical and opera uh, reviewing and feature writing website that myself and Ken Walton set up. And we're delighted to be involved with these series of, of cultural conversations about the uh, development of um, the Old Royal High School. Um, this is the third of those. And uh, this week, uh, this month, we're joined by uh, John Sanders of Simpson and Brown and Paul McDonald of Optimized Environments. Um, and I'm going to start things off by asking them to uh, explain a little about the particular work that their companies do. They both work in very specialized areas. Um, and uh, I think it'd be helpful if they explained um, how they how they work and what their work uh, on this on the project is. Uh, so, John, uh, can you can I ask you to kick off? Yes, of course. Um, uh, Simpson and Brown are a firm that we've been around for forty years, and we've tended to specialise in uh, conservation uh, of architecture, uh, and that I suppose over the last twenty years has, has expanded into. Um, being careful with conservation of the environment as well. Um, it's absolutely fundamental to our approach, and we think to should be fundamental to all conservation approaches that uh, you have to understand the heritage that you're working on before you make decisions about it. And sometimes that allowed more radical decisions uh, than you might otherwise have thought about. And so for that reason, uh, we're a slightly differently set up architectural practice than others in that we include um, uh, four architectural historians within our um, group and six archaeologists. Um, now they they work on projects um, uh, uh, with other architects but um, uh, they're a fantastic resource to be able to work together um, to develop an understanding of a building uh, like this um, to um, uh, which is absolutely essential in order to make to make and justify uh, the kind of decisions to make a building like this sustainable and in this particular case um, uh, uh, we were helped by um, Kirsty who um, was able to um, explain the cultural context of, of Carlton Hill in a way which we we think was new it was part of her uh, research and um uh, uh was um uh, uh, allowed us to see the whole the, the whole place in a broader context which so i think takes us ni nicely on to paul um your 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 um practice is more concerned with the the broader environment of the, of the area around the building as well as the the, the gardens themselves yes Yes, that's that, that's right, Keith. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a landscape architect uh, by training and, a, and an architect also. And uh, open, um, it's short for optimized environments. We tend to look at um, very much contextually driven in any projects that we um, get involved in. And I think you know, as landscape architects, we're kind of notorious of sometimes um, uh, avoiding the avoiding the project and then looking at everything else first and then coming back to it. And I think that is symptomatic of the importance of landscape as a living thing it's, and it's a changing thing and it's not for any specific end user. So we, we look a lot at setting, context, you know, um, 
position and sense of place. And that's linked to time that something has happened in and also the time we're in. So there's cultural things there as well. So we tend to kind of grasp the metal of what's going on over a period of time and, um, you know, and trying to understand the cultural significance and then work our way back to understand why, and in a case like this, the positioning of Colton Hill and or the positioning of the, the monuments and the buildings on Colton Hill, how they've come about um, and how that has changed over a period of time. So we're very interested in that. And then we can start to get into you know, the intricacies of what landscape can bring to a place and, uh, and kind of the very essence of that and ecology and you know, nature and all those sorts of elements. So there's kind of a journey that goes along and um, that's, that's been really important working with, um, with John and Simpson and Brown and understanding that broader cultural heritage, I think. And Thomas Hamilton's building is obviously a, a very singular piece of architecture as it, it, in, in its own right. But I wonder if you could talk both a little about um, the place that it occupies in, in the city. I mean, it, it has a very distinct geographical location between the old and new town uh, and a very specific historical time when it was built almost 200 years ago now. Um, and if, can, you, can you each, perhaps starting with Paul this time, talk about how that affects your knowledge of that, what your knowledge of that is, and how that affects what uh, is done with the building now. Oh, brilliant question. I was hoping you could ask that one, Keith. <laughs> uh, um, do you know, uh, it's, it's fabulous. You know, if you look at the Edinburgh Newtown, you know, in terms of, you know, Edmund Newtown Gardens sitting within the Newtown, they're designed, uh, design gardens and landscapes. So they've got a designation and that stretches from Donaldson's to Colton Hill. It's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. And in that, it's quite unique because a lot of gardens design landscapes like this are not so urban. And we've got a plethora of that through the new town. Isn't that great? A new town design 18th century has got, uses open space as its, as its, as its frame. I mean, that's how, how, how novel is that? I mean, how did we forget that in many of the things that have happened since? But Colton Hill in itself is really unique in that collection it's because it's a very much a natural feature. It wasn't like a, the normal lock or anything that was changed back into green space, but it was natural and it was identified as natural from the very beginning. And from, you know, Craig's plan, James Craig's plan in Newtown, there've been very many other architects have had influence on it. And I think, I mean, the original principles of Colton Hill, which the building sits on, I think was set out by William Stark originally and there's a wonderful little citation from him that, you know, he, he was stressing the importance of natural beauty of the site, the importance of harmonizing buildings and the natural environment. Really, really important. And the epitome of what Playfair came along and positioned buildings and planned that is about following that careful position of monuments and buildings, including the terrace in which Thomas Hamilton's building sits upon. It's so careful, so carefully done and integrated with natural landscape. It's really, really inspiring for how that has influenced us as landscape architects, how we then treat, how we move forward with this. And, and John, the conservation side of this, I mean, how, how much is that part of the location of the building as well as the actual appearance of the building itself? Uh, well, yeah, uh, I, would just like to add a few things to what Paul has said there, um, uh, I, um, but this will come through to the, the conservation in a bit. But I think that one of the things about this scheme is that there is a kind of missing scheme, um, which this was to form part of, which was the third new town, which was uh, Playfair's uh, new town to extend northwards from um, uh, Calton Hill, of which only fragments and a street layout um, was completed. So it was supposed to be seen in, as part of that. But I think um, what I learned from uh, working on this, particularly from uh, Kirsten Carter McKee's work, is that how overt the idea of an Athens of the North um, was in people's minds when this was being 
um, constructed. I mean, I um, used to think it was just a bit of a, a sort of throwaway line, but there were a lot of people who were genuinely thinking of Edinburgh as a great classical city at the centre of an empire, with Edinburgh as Athens with an acropolis in the middle and with temples on that acropolis, and with Leith as Piraeus, where people went down uh, to this fortified port, got in their ships and went off and dominated the world. And um, the location of um, a, a school, a place of education, a place where people are being educated in um, cultural and civic administration um, is really important because it means that um, young people are emerging from this temple, the school temple, in, in the middle of Edinburgh. They're appearing out of this one door in the, in the pediment. So it's incredibly symbolic. You, go, you, you graduate and then you leave through a symbolic door and you merge, emerge out into the centre of Edinburgh with old, smelly, smoky Edinburgh below you, uh, new aspirational Edinburgh behind you on the other side of, of uh, Kelton Hill. And your next step is to, is to leave that, that podium, head down to Piraeus Leith and off to India to administrate the, the empire. And it's all, it was, it was very symbolic, but surprisingly overt in that it, it, it is in a way that school is um, almost a claim for Edinburgh's international uh, role. So in a way, coming back to that conservation side, um, it's just surprisingly how world significance um, this building and particularly its sighting and its meaning is. Mm -hmm. I think just to add to that, I mean, there's a very, there's at that point in time, there's kind of a, a landscape in terms of the very picturesque movement going on. And that is about exactly what John's saying is about the, the, the careful positioning of buildings to create, it's almost a, a procession or almost a ceremony. And it's very particular. It's a natural hill, but it's very carefully set out. And I think that's what John's been kind of explaining. That. I, and I, that's because when you came to look at ruins in Greece and Turkey um, on your on your grand tours, you would find them in natural natural environments. Uh, you didn't find them in in and and so even Thomas Hamilton's villas, if um, Arthur Lodge is in fact by Thomas Hamilton, which we think it is, was always designed to be in an informal landscape. And the same is true of the um, relationship between the galleries on the mound and Princess Street Gardens, it was always a, it was always an informal landscape for a rigorously formal building. Mm. Obviously the environment around the school has changed in the past 200 years. Mm. Um, when you're looking at the conservation of it now, um, what um, is, do you think about it in terms of, in terms of a particular era that you want to um, uh, preserve or do mm. you want to, preserve it in a way that works um, for all that all that time. I mean, obviously, there's been a hot potato with other yeah. other buildings um, like uh, Notre Dame in Paris and what, what era of that should be rebuilt. Um, so how far can it be preserved in terms of the vision that you've just outlined? It is, a, it is a, um, an often expressed thought, isn't it? And I think that um, there are situations where Someone asks us, oh, can we get it back to, to you know, 4th of February in 1769 kind of thing? And um, uh, the answer is, well, no, we can't. <laughs> That's just physically not possible. And, and also, you can't, e even if you could get the building back with precise materials and colours, etc., you just can't get the context back. It's still a building existing now. So the phrase that's been current is that, you can't take a building back, you can only take it forward, but you can take it forward with an understanding of its context and with an understanding of what the original um, designer's intention was, what the original um, sponsor's intention was. So that's where understanding comes in. 
that as long as taking it forward is under is is based on the understanding of why it is like it is and how it has come to be like it is then in a way that gives you a much more open field to work to because in a way you can select the best decisions from the past uh, even if they were taken originally or if they were taken 100 years later and say well actually that decision was a good decision so we want to in, in conserving the best things about the building we're happy to conserve that that um, decision. Mm -hmm. um, Paul in terms of the context then the, the, the broader context of where it sits um, how, how do you look at that in, in the 21st century? Um, I think in terms of uh, the landscape, I think we look at how I mean, landscapes are living, they evolve, you know, and it's and about Colton Hill, it's kind of the interesting kind of uh, relationship between the, the cultural use of it and how the natural landscape has, has evolved and grown around it. And you know, I think at one point, you know, uh, I suppose it was Playfair or whoever, almost split the crag and tail into you know, the region's part side to the crest of the, the, to the kind of the crag. And um, we've seen that evolve. And I think in terms of landscape, we would probably look at um, taking note of that. Very careful when it becomes to national landscape to, to conserve it, to work with it. And you know, right back to 18th century they've worked with this with this piece of land and anything we do with the school even if it comes down to a spaces or series of spaces big question was will be how do we reintroduce nature to a site that is dominated by infrastructure um, and car parking and that's how it would influence us as we approach the site and um, how can we introduce nature to the site but also to the people who then be using it um, and that's 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 a great bit to be involved with, because then the landscape side of it will really start to kind of um, it can offer so much more in, you know, in terms of biodiversity, ecology, um, you know, energy conservation. So we kind of look at it like that. So how it evolves into the site. Does that mean you're looking at it from a practical point of view of what, oh, yes. what you can what can be done in that in that space? Yeah, we, we we can talk about, you know, that and be useful in in yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah exactly. I mean, how's it now going to be used? Like what John was saying there is, you know, we're only looking forward. You know, in some ways, you can only go, and it. Uh, what's great about this is the reemergence as a place of education and culture. Fantastic. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's you can you can work with that so so well. So. I mean, our ideas are really based about, about how this I mean, it's, will it's, address culture today, you know? Yeah, it's, it's um, debatable uh, uh, how successful Thomas's, Thomas Hamilton's building was as a school, even when it was mm -hmm. first constructed. And now we're, the, 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 the project is to make a, 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 a usable, um, not just a place of education, but a place of... Um, uh, that will be publicly um, uh, accessible and useful. Um, how can all these demands, these competing demands, be um, taken together with looking after the environment and conserving the building? Either of you. <laughs> I'll go on that one. I, 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 um, uh, I think the short, answer, uh, the short answer there is with cons considerable architectural skill, and I can say that because in this case, we haven't put that skill in. And in a way, this is one of the great things about working with an architectural practice that is as skillful, innovative, and clever about working with existing buildings as Richard Murphy architects. Um, in that we work with a lot of architects and we really enjoy working and seeing the way that other people work and the way that they think about buildings. And it definitely informs our work and the way that we respond to it in a conservation plan. But we find that the architects that surprise us most with their innovative ideas tends to be Richard. And, um, uh, uh, and that's 
um, it tends to be, the basic brief there is to how to take a building, it was a school building, but it's a different type of school, and make it in sustainable into the future. If our ad conservation advice was just saying, well, you can't do this and you can't do that, then it wouldn't be very useful conservation advice. And um, it, it's the sort of thing that gives conservation advice a kind of bad name. We like to be much more creative about that and respond to um, innovative ideas with conservation um, uh, guidance. And so um, uh, I, th I, I think that comes back to the way to deal with that is to, is to have someone in the mix who was coming up with really good ideas about um, a sustainable future for the building, which is the basic conservation requirement. Um, and uh, being able to mold or guide those into in, in a route which takes the, the conservation and preservation of the building into account. Into account. Mm -hmm. Did I Paul, just how, is your, how have your ideas for the garden got to do with what the building will be doing now? Yeah, could I possibly just share my screen? Because maybe John and I can maybe just reference things just, just, yeah. just, just for a couple of slides, and we can talk over that. Um, I think that hopefully you can see my my screen there. Have I got Have I got a nod? Yeah. Yes. Um, so just I'm just I've just picked a slide there that, that that's, just, that's just come up with some of the historical picturesque views that John and us and and I work were were kind of talking about and uh, the Athens of the north and the views and prayers down by the down down by the sea. But in reality, I mean, uh, in terms of the hill itself, not not a lot has changed, you know. Well, the world has changed around it. It's, it's been quite interesting, and that makes it extra special in, in landscape terms. And as John said, we worked a lot in terms of design of, let's just talk about the environment for a second, um, with Richard, with John, and exploring ideas of what would help the, the future use and um, influence of this building. So we looked at the spaces. Because today, we're, we're kind of presented with something like this, which is a site it's almost, it's got car parking, it's dominated by its infrastructure, um, it's almost an island within that, within that terrace that was beautifully formed along the contours working with the landscape. And we worked very, very closely with about, well, what, what is the public front of this? What are people going to come and experience? And, you know, arriving from the city on this side, what are you going to do? So one of the ideas was there was a series of spaces through this and um, that you would approach the building yeah you would see the building from a distance as you would always have seen it but in terms of the public the opportunity to create a new public garden as an interface and a merging of landscape and uses and school and cultural uses as you um, further proceeded through the site so this area was really to become a garden um, and I'll just share this image of it this is a, a plan that's probably on the planning portal, but so this side we call the, the West Garden. And the idea was to open this to the public. I mean, there's been questions about what, what this was used for before as a school. It was probably a play yard, really. Um, but the idea was to open this as a garden, a series of terraces following the, the basic principles of Colton Hill and to take the nature from the hill down into this, not to create some pristine garden, but something that could um, reflect the nature and the species and the biodiversity. So that's where we get a little bit more specific. But within that, allowing areas for performance, because we're looking at a cultural venue, outside performance, maybe bringing some of the school and education to this side as a public front, maybe education and growing um, and uh, horticulture. So that garden became a contribution to the city in terms of public space. And I know the building is as a you know, it's so important, but so the spaces in the whole new town and design garden landscape. And here's a chance for the building and the position of the building to give some of that back, but to do it in a reflection of what would be meaningful today, you know, without, without impinging on the setting of the building. So this garden was really 
really important, as were the southern terraces, where you know, John was saying about how you came out and you looked over the wonderful ge geological landscape and the old medieval old town, the new town. These are fantastic spaces. As you get further in, they become a little bit more private, a little bit more about performance and reflection. You can stand or sit here. Nobody can see you, but you can see the city. It's magic, absolutely magic. And as you proceed further into maybe the more of the educational edge of the school and play and courtyards, it becomes a little bit more intimate and, and, and private. A wonderful progression through it. Um, while it doesn't impinge at all on the views, on kind of the city views. So, um, and there's other elements like green roofs and elements to bed new, new parts of the building in that have huge energy efficient elements to it. So we're always thinking of where we are, 21st century and how landscape can help with that. Mm -hmm. And that as a piece, and we all know it from this last one, how important landscape is um, in terms of open space, well-being. It creates a great interface for public education and culture. That I actually think in this in this context, it's pretty unique anywhere in the, in this in this sort of setting in in the UK. And how do we then bring music and that education of culture into forming this? Because this is just an idea. Imagine sitting down and in a fusion, a collaboration to actually design this. That that's just mind blowing, to be honest. So how you, we can start to do that. So I just thought I'd show that and just maybe get it down to maybe some of the kind of proposals of how it might look. And we were just talking about views of the garden and the terracing. And these are just ideas, school entrance, the terraces down from Colton Hill, the Southern Terrace. And I think possibly my favorite, just last view of this is that's how it is at the moment. And that view, I mean, imagine learning in this environment, you talk about curriculum for excellence and being outside and learning. Um, you look out your window and you've got, you know, thousands of years or millions of years of history in front of you, um, uh, right, you know, and we can change that. We can give that back to the city. It's just the new, for us, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at John there, but I'm just from a landscape point of view, wow, we can, we, we can really start to play with that and uh, create something very unique as is Colton Hill. So, so that's how it gets down to that, Keith, there's so many things. And, yeah. uh, is, is there an element of softening the landscape around it or is it more about actually revealing the building uh, as well? Oh, I think if you ask John and I, would put, you probably get two slightly two different answers. I would say obviously in the environment, it's, it's, it's it, there is a softening to, to certain aspects of it, I think. Mm. Um, because at the moment we've got a car park on, on our public side. And um, I think all the time we were working with John and Richard, we were thinking if any landscape is sitting there and you look at the set piece back to the picturesque images that we showed you at the beginning, none of that should influence that. It should all be subservient to that. But as a human being in it, it's changing, and, you know, it's, and I think um, that's been a very interesting appreciation of why we have to look at context and culture from a distance and come back to the site because the building on the site on the contour is the most important thing from a distance and as you as a human being interact with that and get closer your whole relationship with it starts to change and that's where it starts to soften i don't know if you want to add to that john yeah john yes i i, I think i have a, a similar point of view on that. I, I also have a, an image to share on this, if that's okay. I'll see if I can get the right one up. This one will do. So can you see that in the middle of the screen now? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, this relates to um, the significance analysis for the landscape. We, we did a significance analysis for the building in plan, which is usually enough for most buildings, saying what's important, what's less important, where can, where, can you, where can you concentrate change in a way that doesn't affect the overall significance of the building. This is, was, it became absolutely obvious that we had to think, we had to present the significance of this building in three dimensions because um, uh, uh, 
the way that the building sits and its uh, relative significance of different walls or different aspects are really important. So this is our analysis of views towards the building, over the building, um, our analysis of which bits are of international significance, um, which bits are um, less significant. Often this kind of analysis seems very crude because it seems to be, well, it is ranking stuff. And in a case of an entirely symmetrical classical object on a hill, that is a little bit controversial, but we have to do this in order to be able to facilitate design. We have to be able to tell the other designers um, um, building and uh, landscape, not tell, but guide them to say, this is where change is possible and desirable. And these other places are where um, change is, uh, is less desirable and where um, um, uh, conservation in terms of putting back something that's, that's missing um, um, is better placed. Just see if I can find another, uh, an, another image there. Um, um, go to this one. No, sorry, that's the one we've just had. <laughs> um, uh, never mind. I think the, 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 this one tells the same, the same sort of story anyway. But th this, this is, the, in a way, the conservation background for the, uh, for the images that Paul has shown. Mm. Um, uh, while I've got images up, can I just take a little diversion? Um, have you got the Thomas Hamilton? drawn image up, up in front of you. Um, no, this is the original drawings. Yes, the original mm. drawings. Has, has that come up and has that come up? Not yet, John. No, I'll, 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 I'll just do something else uh, and see. No. There you go, John. Is that up now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, this is a little bit of a diversion, but it does illustrate some conservation issues that arise from research. Um, to some extent, this building is internationally famous for its austerity. I'm and, not seeing it yet, John. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Um, oh, there we are. Yeah, that's it. It, 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 yeah. it often comes up about a minute after I've yeah. been on screen. So <laughs> it's, one of the, it's one of the things I have to learn about Zoom. <laughs> um, I, I hope every, everyone can now see that it, it's Thomas Hamilton's um, Royal Academy uh, submission image um, of, the, of the high school, uh, which is a design image. Um, um, around about 1828 I think so it's 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 before the building's built and um, um, uh, it's interesting what it tells us because this building internationally famous for its austerity everyone praises it oh my goodness you you've really taken Greek revival to be a really mm. severe austere thing but if we look at this we can see that that wasn't Hamilton's idea at all, he's had to scrub out a statue over every column. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can just see it in it, it coming through the watercolour there, that he was wanting that skyline to not be very severe and horizontal, but to have a, a whole run of statues along there. Obviously, on top of the pediment, we've got uh, um, uh, the normal Greek detailing, which wasn't there, but we've also got a full... Um, uh, um, um, sculptural element within yeah. the um, tympanum. Yeah. Um, we've got this frieze down here. We've got sculptures added on here. He did get the lamp standards done, but um, uh, there is, there's more decoration down here. In a way, it was intended to be much more faithful to Greek originals and possibly less, and not have the kind of Vic, uh, 18th, 19th century modernism that was, uh, that was proposed for it. Um, and uh, in a way, the Greek revival, even in the USA, would have been different if Hamilton had 
actually got his way and um, uh, um, produced the building he wanted to produce in the, originally. I, I do think that this is a case where cost has helped produce a better building, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but that might be all to do with my my perceptions of the 19th century Greek revival in that buildings like this have influenced what I what I score or rate as being high quality Greek revival and valuing its austerity. So it's quite interesting to find that the the designers of that Greek revival didn't actually see things the same way. No. And it also, in his vision, wouldn't really have the the clean lines that everybody associates with new town architecture. It would have been something of a departure from that in this side of the of the city. Right. Yes. Now when you when you come to conservation, do you say, I mean, in this case, no, because there's been a 150 years of, of well, 200 years of, of um, um, uh, uh, further artistic perception loaded onto this design. Yeah. But there are other situations where you say, well, actually, let's go back to the original architects or original designer's idea and see whether that does improve things. Yeah. I'm, I'm not rushing to suggest a whole load of sculptures along the along the <laughs> but there are other situations where that kind of research does reveal things which do change perceptions and are worth uh, 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 adopting into a, a building and it's de it's definitely worth discussing because it just enriches the understanding of the of the building yeah. Well, perhaps we should let Thomas Hamilton have the last visual word on our, our screen there for the time being. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you very much both for your for your um, explanation so far. And um, see if there are any any questions that people want to want to put on that huge amount of information that you've already put out there. Um, has anybody anybody got questions there, Peter? I do have a question, and it comes actually from the teacher of biology and PSE at St. Mary's Music School, wanting to know um, how soon um, the pupils can start to collaborate on designing the space for their use. <laughs> I think that's I think that's a question that you can answer, Peter, is it not? <laughs> Indeed, I, I think I, I think you have a ready audience of people who would wish to collaborate with you, Paul, on uh, the use of that space, which is great to hear. And that's the way it should it should be done, because that then is a reflection of the time we're in, more so than anything else. It is an interesting question. What does a, what does a music garden look like? Um, have you any ideas on that, Paul? No, I, I keep a very open mind in that. I, I have come across, I was exp explaining to Peter before, a few small music installation and gardens. There's one in the uh, Parc de la Vallette in Paris um, called the Sunken Garden. And But it's not, oh, depends, depends what you call music, I think. It's certainly a sound garden, you know, so. But it definitely needs collaboration between people who know and, and uh, what they're talking about and inspire and inspiring. And I listened to the last conversation, you know, with uh, you know talking about the Seven Hills, and it was very interesting talking just just hearing about being in the moment, being and not being maybe perhaps directly influenced, but just being inspired, you know, by working and collaboration. So I think that's important. So what, what sort of input and from whom um, will you be looking for then as, as, as your thoughts on the, on the environment around building proceed? Well, definitely we have to work with, um, I think, it, well, with any education establishment, any school, we would definitely want to work with pupils. We do that in many of our projects, wherever we are in the country. Um, and that would definitely be the first protocol. But as then it's understanding working with the students, let's say, but also maybe working with other cultural, you know, cl collaborators, whether it's poetry or whether it's writing and getting that fusion together. And I think, I, th I think that's something that could be perhaps led by some of the conversations that we've been, ha uh, we've been having through these um, monthly events. So, we want, there's, there's such an opportunity here to raise the bar 
And I think um, Edinburgh has got a, a lot of wonderful new and restored, let's call them secret gardens or public gardens from the new, from the Physic Garden to um, down, down the road to Dunbar's Close, which is right beside Cannon Gate Kirk opposite. Beautiful, intimate and inspiring places, all done through collaboration. Mm -hmm. Before I hand over uh, to the hosting guests, there's one question that's come up that I think I can answer, which is what is the current timescale for the project? Um, at the moment, uh, the Royal High School Preservation Trust um, are looking to the um, release of the tender uh, document that will be released by the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, and they are poised to respond to that with some of the plans that you've heard about today. Um, at that point, um, I understand that the city hopes to make a decision uh, sometime in the autumn um, as to who the tender will be awarded to. And at that point, it will uh, take uh, another year of activity of planning, um, perhaps about two years of uh, build time for the project. Uh, and with the fair wind, uh, uh, if successful, this could be uh, reopened as a school in uh, late 2025. Uh, and so that gives you a, an idea of one of the timescales, but all of this is, of course, dependent on the Royal High School Preservation Trust being successful with the tender. I'll hand over to you, Keith. Um, I, I was wondering if um, there was already any input uh, that has come uh, via uh, to both of you um, from uh, neighbours in the in the in the area. Obviously, the the, the whole uh, the community around there. There's a lot of a uh, lot of homes up in the hill, and uh, I wondered if uh, you've been speaking to them about the. You, you mentioned the private gardens of Edinburgh, and here here's a garden that will be partly private and partly public. Um, I, I, we've had relatively little opportunity to do that so far, um, but it will be important. Uh, I, I'd also like to add to Paul's point about the um, inclusion of um, uh, work from um, students, because um, it's an opportunity that we so often miss in um, conservation of buildings. Um, and it, it's a great shame. And I think in particular, the, the age group that conservation tends to miss or is most difficult to reach tends to be the ages between 10 and 20. Um, uh, and so there is an opportunity to be able to reach that age group here that uh, wouldn't be, isn't available at other places. And also to say that um, it doesn't have to be a physical intervention. Um, so if um, people are inspired to take photographs, make, make music, make soundscapes, um, uh, make films um, uh, for, uh, that could be projected or played within the building, those are all things that uh, would add to the richness and the um, cultural significance of the building. I think um, going back to your question there, Keith, um, it's to be honest, it's been since 2015. I couldn't believe the years have passed. 2015 since we started looking at this, John. And uh, yeah, there's been a, a legacy of things that have happened since then. But the actual what you see and being presented today is back to then. And there were there were the uh, dialogue with um, uh, residents at that point. But to be honest, been nothing since then, and that's that's a key part to bring to be back into this. There's one wee thing is John's just twigged, twigged my memory there of, of things, and when you're coming to public space and um, specifically public space and collaboration, the thing about it is public space is not like designing for a building which might have an end user. Um, it it's it's trying. You're trying on one level to design for everybody, but that's also an, also a mistake. What? Because you can't. You have to design within the setting and the place and be influenced by many, many things. But in the essence, you're not buying, trying to be too literal 
your lounge, you want spaces to, of course, be beautiful, but you've, they've got to be inspiring. You've got to feel comfortable. You've got to feel safe. You've got to feel as if you can get into the moment, whether it's to watch a film that's up there for an hour in the afternoon or whether it's um, for a small performance or whether it's just to find time on your own. So there's a whole dynamic of what spaces need to do. And it's, uh, it's quite an alchemy actually when, um, and a decision process, but you, you need to garner the thoughts of many for that. And uh, that's, that is really important. The greatest satisfaction of designing public spaces is when people start to take ownership of them themselves in ways that you could never have imagined. And that's, that's, that's kind of the holy grail almost, to see that evolve. It, it does seem particularly appropriate that this is part of the project and part of the thinking um, when, when we've just come through the time that we have and so many people have rediscovered their own outdoor spaces and learned to appreciate them um, in other ways and learn to appreciate the value of growing things. Can you, um, do you think that the, the, the public spaces here will have a horticultural um, purpose and actually, um, you know, there'll be somewhere where the, the pupils might be uh, growing, growing things um, as part of their education? Oh, I would be disappointed if it wasn't one of the, one of the key ideas in this. And, and yeah, the, the students themselves have, will have their own own very private areas, which you could do that. But I think that interface, the whole point of public space is to get that interface between the user or the, the core user, let's say, and the public. And um, we see great uh, leaps forward in growing in public spaces and people taking ownership. And it'd be great if the students could do that um, within the more public front of that, totally possible. And you, you just want that engagement. Also, that gives a sense of use. It gives, and it always gives an immediate sense of safety. If somebody's, if somebody's overtly caring for something, these are all quite psychological elements that are key to, um, you know, embracing that sort of uh, uh, public space. So I really do hope that that well, it will be. It has to be. Mm -hmm. so. And, and looking looking forward, the the um, obviously the building has had a number of potential uses over the over the over the time, and some of these will be detectable um, in the in the finished design this time, and some of them will will be a matter of archive. But looking forward, how do you think that the the the, the picture of the building might look in? 10, 20 years time. Before we share another image on this, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, here we are. Um, I don't know whether that's come up yet, but it's an image of the interior of the central hall. Um, um, now, um, uh, in a way, your question is about the past, and that, that there has been a lot of incredibly important, or particularly um, uh, the kind of 1978, um, 1979 history about this and how resonant this is with contemporary um, politics, um, and um, the way that the whole chamber was kitted out. Uh, for that um, parliament that never devolved parliament that never happened so um, that has to be recorded it's a very important part physical and uh, it's a very physical embodiment of a very important part of Scotland's history and we, we would be um, we would be criticized if that wasn't recorded very carefully now to some extent it has been recorded quite well but I think that the way that it might best be recorded is as a kind of project to say well here is the physical embodiment the seats and everything before it's changed but also um uh, it should be a it should be a film it should be a documentary uh, there should be people who are around who are still involved should be um uh, uh, should be interviewed about this there's a there's a whole um there's a there's a kind of um 
a bit of cultural and political history here, which needs more analysis than just recording where the chairs, where, where the MSPs were going to sit. Um, but it is, it is very important to uh, record what was there. Uh, it's part of the reason that we are archaeologists in that, as well as understanding, we do use archaeological techniques to record because we find that's the best way to answer uh, future questions. So the, the situation, uh, this kind of situation, I always imagine a thesis writer in the future coming to me and saying, what do you know about that, um, that, that, that building before you changed it? And I don't want to be in the situation where I say, oh, well, we, we had information that would be really interesting to you, but we didn't bother recording it. I, I couldn't face that putative future thesis, thesis writer. So uh, I, I want to be in a position where uh, I've, I've got all that information recorded, even if we're changing it. Um, the reason for showing this image is that it's to show how that space could be made flexible for performance and a number of other uses. Now, this is Richard's design. Um, but it does involve some conservation in that um, there's a lot of history of different colours on the walls. Um, we haven't been able to get access to be able to fully understand the decorative history of this building, which is done by micro microscope analysis. So in a way, this is a, this is a guess at the moment. Um, but in redecorating this, this room, we have to understand how it was decorated in the past. And whilst not necessarily putting everything back again, we use that as a guide to take it forward. Another reason to show this image was that, um, um, uh, and this is something that didn't work out, but I, uh, I was aware that in Hamilton's original design, he didn't have columns supporting the front of the galleries. He had these big brackets. And I thought it would be rather fun with um, 21st century technology and engineering to support those um, um, balconies using the um, uh, uh, using new technology to be able to, to provide that structural support. Uh, unfortunately, um, Historic Environment Scotland didn't agree with me, so we, we don't <laughs> have permission to do that. <laughs> uh, yes, and looking forward, um, what, what, what will the, the, the mature environment around it ideally look like um, when, when, this, um, when, the, when the building is, is once more um, uh, 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 an uncontroversial part of the Edinburgh landscape uh, as, as a music school and a, and a concert hall. Oh, I mean, I think in terms of, you know, approaching on foot by active travel from the city, from the city centre, from, you know, um, at Waterloo Place and that, you, you are going to be introduced to, to that East elevation across a new public space, a new a new garden, and um, it's funny when John showed that visual analysis of significance, and there was a couple of options and schemes where we were considering actually any garden to that side would actually maybe remove quite a lot of the trees, but you know, and and actually keep everything down. But you're gonna you're gonna be you know uh, you're gonna have a very um, inviting uh, and clear uh, and comfortable space to approach the building from from that perspective mm. but from those views from Salisbury Crags from the Canongate Kirk you know it's still going to bed itself into the contour it's still going to look you know as 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 maybe as austere and as clean as um John has kind of suggested, and I know we might use some of the front terraces. Once you're out there and you're standing in them, and you sit, just you, the, the human scale, you just sit down, you just disappear. But you, there, there's a wonderful hide and seek element to it. And I think um, it's very difficult to kind of put across because there's so many, there's a, there's a building and there's a setting, but there's so many human elements to it. 
And of course, there's a small garden across the road, remembering the 1979 oh, referendum and, and George, with George Wiley's sculpture in, the, um, yeah. in it as well. So, Indeed. Yeah. Well, thank you very much both. Um, and thank you everybody for, uh, for uh, tuning in to this today. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, John. Um, uh, anything, else to, anything else to say, Peter, um, in, a, in a housekeeping way? No. No, and uh, please, um, if I can uh, commend voxcarnix.com to you. Um, we'll we're trying to keep up to date with um, the musical life of Scotland as things start to reopen. Uh, and uh, Ken and I are going to be very busy over the next couple of weeks, so there'll be plenty there to read. Um, and uh, there'll be more about the development of the, uh, the old Royal High School as well. Good to see you all. <laughs>